I want to begin tonight telling you guys about an experience I had that kind of shaped how I think about the world. Um, a few years ago, it was 2008, um, I went to Greece and it was my first time out of the country. I went with the Honors Abroad program through Harding. Um, and I was just completely in awe of these different temples and the beautiful architecture that has just stood the test of time over thousands of years. Um, and you can see me here with the Parthenon behind me on the Acropolis. And I, I brought these pictures back home with me um, and was showing my relatives and we were all kind of ooing and aahing over it. And then I had this one relative who came up to me and she said, why are you guys making such a big deal about pagan temples built to pagan gods? Um, and the question kind of took me off guard, and it really kind of bothered me, although I didn't know why. I couldn't pinpoint it at the time. Um, but that, kinda, that question kind of shaped the trajectory of my academic career over the next few years and the thesis that I ended up writing for my master's degree. Um, and the question that I asked myself is this, is there anything of worth in unchristian things for Christians? Um, that's the question that I keep coming back to. And you may be thinking, what is the English teacher doing talking about Greek temples? What does this have to do with the power of story or anything? Um, the short answer to that is that I believe that stories are all around us. Um, I believe that we are constantly trying to tell our stories in any way that we possibly can, that we're trying to figure out our purpose in this world, why we're here, and we're trying to figure out our relationship with a higher power. And when I say stories, I mean in the broadest context, texts. And what I mean by text is anything that tells our story. So it can be a written document, it can be um, music, art, it can even be architecture like these temples where we're trying to figure out what our relationship is with the higher power. And I believe that these stories are inherently powerful for us. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who I'm sure you guys know is the author of The Lord of the Rings, talks about this inherent need we have to create and to tell our story, and he calls it sub-creation. Uh, Subcreation is this idea that because we are created beings, created by a creator God, um, and made in his image, that it means that we too have this need to create because we're like him. And so when we realize that, um, it kind of helps us figure out, first of all, that it's a very cool phenomenon. Second of all, it's kind of helping us figure out the truth of our existence, and that's what we're really seeking when we're telling stories. Um, but to understand the truth of our existence, that's a big thing when we start asking what is truth. Um, and if you guys are afraid I'm going to get all philosophical and deep with you, um, I am a little bit, but bear with me because this is important. Um, when we ask what is truth, when we ask what is truth uh, and why these different stories like the ones you see here are so important to us, um, there are several different answers that you can give. The first one I think that contemporary society would tell you is that truth is what you can quantify, what you can um, experience through the physical senses. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, ancient um, oral storytelling traditions would tell you the exact opposite. They would say that what is most true and what is most real is that which is supernatural, which has to do with gods and goddesses. And then um, when we're talking about what's true in stories, we're talking about that which resonates within us, which feels real, even though it's a made-up story, even though it's fiction. And so when you cry at the end of Harry Potter because your favorite character dies, and I won't say which character, um, that's because there's something there that feels real to you, right? There's something true about that. Now, C.S. Lewis uh, talks about a fourth definition of truth, and that is truth with a capital T, absolute truth. And for Christians, that absolute truth is, of course, Christ, right? It's the idea that Christ is both a historical figure and a God. He's both man and deity, that he came and died and sacrificed himself for us and that he resurrect, was resurrected. Um, and so that is our absolute truth. That's the truth that does not change. Um, and so if you, if you were to say that Christ is truth, you can also say by extension that he is the true story, right? He's the story that really happened, He's both a mythic figure in the sense that there are some mythical qualities to the Bible, but he's also a historically documented figure. Um, C.S. Lewis calls Christianity the true myth. And what he means by that is that there's this idea that if Christianity is the true myth, if it's a myth that really happened, then it's also possible that every story and every myth ever told is simply a retelling of, some, of one single event that actually happened. 
And that's what he believes is happening in different world mythologies and stories and fantasy and literature and all those kind of things, is that we actually have these, see these little fragments and pieces of truth, of the truth of Christ being told over and over again. And that can even happen in stories and myths that are not explicitly Christian, right? Um, and so I'll give you an example of kind of what I'm talking about here. Um, now, what you might think initially is, wait, 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 you know, how can we see truth in things that aren't explicitly Christian? How can we see truth in, like, Greek mythology or um, the Hunger Games or whatever, whatever kind of text you want to talk about? And if you, were, if you were to say that when we normally talk about myth and story and we say that that's untrue, you would be correct. That's usually what we think about. In fact, if you were to go look up myth in the dictionary, you would get something about like this. This is from dictionary.com. And you can see that it says that myth is uh, an invented story, a fictitious thing, um, a false belief. And so we usually think about that as being something untrue. On the other side of that, we usually think about logic and reason as things that we can prove, things that are true, right? Well, would you believe me if I told you that originally... Um, way, way, way long time ago, uh, myth and logic, or their Greek words mythos and logos, were actually pretty synonymous with each other. Um, mythos meaning an account or a way of knowing, a way of understanding our world through story. Um, and logos meaning a way of understanding the world through logic and reason. Of course, over time, these two different definitions have kind of grown apart, and so they're now we kind of treat them like they're opposites. Um, but that wasn't always the case. And the cool thing about stories, and fantasy in particular, is that it's one of the rare places that we have today where you can actually see this mythos and logos kind of rejoining. Um, and the reason why that's important is because when we rejoin the mythos and logos together the way that they were intended to be, we get the most complete view of the true story and the true myth of Christ. And so... Um, you may be asking, okay, so what does that look like? What's a practical example of that? So, um, the first thing, mythos, when you're talking about mythos of a story, uh, let's just say fantasy or myth, uh, world mythologies, you have uh, the truth of Christ broken down into these little pieces and these little fragments that we call archetypes. And archetypal images are images that can be tweaked and twisted and changed over time, but... Um, no matter how much they're changed, you can still recognize them as being what they are. And I think the most common one probably for Christians that to recognize is the Savior archetype, right? Um, so that's Christ. Now, we see that archetype in a lot of other places too, though, right? So like here we've got, uh, this is Balder from Norse mythology. This is Prometheus from Greek mythology. Hercules is another one, and my personal favorite, Gandalf, uh, from The Lord of the Rings. And so you have all these different um, archetypes showing up all over the place, and we'll talk about why that's important here in a second. Um, on the other hand, you've got the logos of um, fantasy, and what that is is the, um, the mythic language used in fantasy. And the reason why that is important um, is because fantasy has this really cool ability to show us the power, the inherent power in language in a way that we don't normally see in our everyday world. And so um, when we read a story like Lord of the Rings, for example, since that's my favorite, I'm sorry if you're not a Lord of the Rings fan, just bear with me. Um, but when we see a story like this, what we realize is that language in fantasy has the power to alter states of being, either for good or evil, and we call that magic, right? Magical language has the ability to either include people, to um, bring people into a community, to show love, to bridge gaps between people and build relationships, or it can destroy, right, and it can tear down. And there's a big difference between the way that language is used here um, on, the, on the ring, which is literally used to enslave the person that wears it, and the way that Gandalf uses language to save his friends. Um, again, I'm a Lord of the Rings nerd, so... Uh, just bear with me on that. But you get kind of see the difference here. And the reason why this is important to us as Christians um, especially is because I believe that there is an inherent connection uh, between fantasy and faith. And that's why it's so ironic to me a lot of the time when Christians are the ones who try to discredit or condemn fantasy stories because I do believe that some of the same things that go into believing a fantasy story 
Um, the same things that touch us when we read fantasy are the same things that we need and require to have a Christian faith. Um, and so um, because of that, I think that uh, when we see the way that uh, language has power in fantasy, what that's really showing us is the ability that language has to exert power um, in our real lives as well. And that may sound a little bit um, crazy or foreign to you, but if you think about it, I'll give you an example of what that looks like. Um, if we start talking about the Holy Spirit working through us, um, the Holy Spirit uh, a lot of times uses language to include people and show people the love of Christ, right? Um, one great example of that is the day of Pentecost. If you remember in Acts, the disciples start speaking these other languages so that people can what can be included, um, in the love of Christ. And it may sound a little crazy, like I said, to start talking about how magic and fantasy is comparable to the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. But nevertheless, what I'm talking about is not sorcery. What I'm talking about is the inherent power that language has to create or to destroy. And, of course, we want to use it to create. And I think that the first step in doing that is to realize the power that language has and to use that to build community, because that's what, exactly what Christ did with language. And that's what, what we realize through uh, reading fantasy and through reading these stories. <clears throat> Not only that, but um, Christian scholar David Lyle Jeffrey says that we are people of the book, and Christians of all people should um, feel a strong connection to language and should recognize that power, because um, the sacred text of the Bible and language forms a big part of our identity as Christians. Um, we are uh, people who have a creator God who literally spoke the world into existence. Our Savior um, is the Word made flesh. And so we have this connection, right, that I think we need to realize and appreciate. And if there's one um, takeaway that I want you guys to remember from this, it's that it's that connection. It's the fact that when we talk, start talking about spells and magic and things like that, when we start talking about that in the context of the God spell, what that literally means is that we are telling the good story, and that's where we get the word gospel from. And so there is a connection there. So ultimately, stories have this ability to revitalize our faith. Um, and that's why I think that we as Christians have the responsibility to take stories seriously and treat them lovingly. Um, another Christian scholar, Alan Jacobs, talks about in his book, A Theology of Reading, this idea of the, a charitable reading. And his idea there is that texts of all kinds, anything that we create, is an extension of the person who created it. And so when we treat it in a certain way, it's like we're treating that person a certain way. And since we have um, the command to love our neighbor as ourselves, we also need to treat their creations lovingly. And when we really internalize that idea, it has the power to really just kind of transform the way that we look at stories and world mythologies when we see that there's truth in all of them, um, even if that they didn't intend for it to be there. It's still there nevertheless. And when we see that, it has the ability to, um, to revitalize our faith, to, to help us see things in a new light that maybe we di didn't see before. And most importantly, it has the ability to bridge gaps and build community with people who think differently from us. Because when we see that there are those commonalities there, we can actually start to have a conversation with people who might not believe in Christianity, but who might understand why we love story. And that can be our launching point for going forward and building community with other people. So thank you.